Dr. Amy Or Ewing has chatted a whole bunch about faith, culture, theology over the last few years. She is a director of OCCA, the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics, and is the Senior Vice President for Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. What a pleasure to be chatting to Dr. Amy now. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. It's great to be with you today. Thank you. You've written and released now what has ended up being quite a timely book because you wrote this before yeah. the pandemic. And it's being released right in the midst of it for so many around the world. It's called Where is God in the Suffering? A question many people could be asking at the moment. Why was suffering yeah. on your mind? Because it's maybe an unusual topic to dive into. Yeah, sure. Um, well, thanks for the question. Yeah, um, I've been involved in um, Christian ministry and speaking in apologetics and evangelism for over 20 years on university campuses and all sorts of um, contexts around the world. And my experience is that this uh, this question, where is God in all the suffering, is is a universal question globally. People are are, are asking this. How could it be that a loving God actually exists and this be the world that we're living in. And so um, in some senses, I've been writing this book for 20 years, you know, because you come across um, multiple kinds of suffering in life, whether it's grief through the loss of a loved one or um, friends and a close family who've been abused as children or whether it's a kind of suffering related to natural events like fires and viruses like we're all experiencing and I really wanted to write a book that didn't only address the intellectual side of the question how could this be the world we're in and God actually exist and be loving but also really address the kind of depth and profundity and actual pain of people's lived experience. Mm. And in my experience, a lot of kind of Christian books on suffering sort of do one well. They either address the sort of philosophical dilemma well, or um, it's more a sort of exploration of, of how we feel in the midst of suffering and how we might kind of process that psychologically as Christians. And I really want to kind of bring, wanted to sort of bring those two elements together. Seeing those questions be asked on a mass level of what does my own mortality mean? Does my life have purpose? It's quite a bizarre moment in history to be part of because each of us may be asked those questions individually at lots of different times in our lives, but we're all asking it together now in some kind of way. What impact do you think that's going to have on sort of society at large, the church, that we have all walked through this experience together and to varying degrees, as you say, we've experienced suffering in our own sorts of ways. What, what sort of effect do you think it's going to have? Actually, it can have quite different effects on the same people. So for some people who, who've really profoundly and deeply asked the question, um, it could lead to a deepening of faith. One of the things I try and say in this book is that um, questions are and doubts are not the enemy of Christian faith. The Christian worldview actually mm. gives us a framework for processing our grief, our doubt, our anger, um, and our pain and you know God is not sort of offended by people asking why how can this be even expressing outrage um, but sometimes the church has a bit of a tendency to say well don't do that that would be in some way sort of disloyal to God or you know the whole thing might collapse if we question it and so you have you have these sort of almost religious platitudes like just have a bit more faith and don't think about it too much and I think really depending on how we've processed um, these events that's actually going to affect what the long-term impact is mm. on us and so I think we're going to see um, some Christian communities experiencing real growth and others sort of catastrophic decline to be honest. Why do you yeah. think that seeing suffering makes us ask where is God? Why do you think suffering triggers that question? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I think that um, if you look at this question through the lens of alternatives to Christian faith, it helps us reflect on that. So um, if, you, if you think about, you know, massive scale suffering of people very far away from us, whether, you know, it's 
the refugees caught up in the um, disaster in Greece or the Yazidi women or whatever it is. So when I observe what happened to the Yazidi women and I feel rage, I feel outrage that this could happen to, to women, to human beings. Mm. I've never met them. I have no evolutionary predisposition to care about their well be- well-being, but something within me as a person, whether I'm a Christian or not, something within me as a person is utterly outraged mm. that this could happen. And I think that rage is only explained by the Christian worldview. And that tells us that human beings, whether they believe in God or not, are created in the image of God, that there is a sacredness, that there is a preciousness to human life. And so even our response to the suffering of others actually points us to the existence of a loving God who Mm. made us and who gives our lives meaning and purpose and sacredness. So um, I actually think that the question of suffering, if we really think about it, points us towards a loving God and not away from him. Mm. You explain that so wonderfully because it's something that is, it's such a complex mystery in so many ways. I recently spoke to somebody who said that within our Christian faith, that question of how we do serve a loving God and yet how they're suffering, that's one of the greatest mysteries and the greatest tensions within the Christian faith. But you've summed it up so well. And in it though, I do wonder for for some people suffering and you hear testimonies about this all the time people telling their own stories of how they had the worst crisis the worst loss and found god in it that's when they saw god mm. that's when they found faith and then you have some people who go through the exact same kind of scenario and yet it's when they lose their faith or deny christ yeah. the whole thing yeah. What do you think yeah. the difference is between the person who finds yeah. God in suffering and the person who completely rejects any idea of God or faith or religion yeah. or any of that? I think that is such an important question. And for me, um, the sort of crux of that question is around um, what our preconceptions are about who God is and our expectations of a faith-filled life. You see, If we come to God with a sort of narrative of God is loving and that means that God wants me to have the most comfortable and um, protected, blessed life in this world and therefore I connect my feelings of whether God loves me or not with my experiences of the circumstances of this world. If I do that, when I have a cancer diagnosis or when, you know, my friend goes through an experience of domestic violence, Mm. I conclude that God must not be loving because he hasn't intervened to stop it. And then I begin to conclude maybe he doesn't exist and the whole thing is made up. Now, what I find interesting about that way of looking at God is that that is not the world that the Bible describes or the God that the Bible describes. Mm. See, what the Bible describes is that, yes, a loving God exists and he created a good world, but he created a world in which um, human beings have the capacity to love because we're created in his image. And that means that we also have the capacity to make decisions because love can't be compelled. So for love to exist, freedom has to exist. We have to have the capacity to make choices. And the Bible describes a world in which love exists, but also choice exists. And that our choices have harmed ourselves. They've harmed others. They've harmed others that we are very distantly related to. So there's a knock-on effect of our selfishness. And they've also actually harmed the environment, the actual Mm. fabric of, of, of the world. So human selfishness impacts um the world you know you could you can read climate change back into genesis 3 i think um and so we don't then conclude that a loving god doesn't exist in a suffering world we actually look at the bible and think wow the experience of slavery is described in the bible the experience of being an oppressed people an exiled people the experience of being a refugee the experience of being a woman who is raped the experience of being someone who is murdered or Mm. has violence perpetrated against them is all described by the bible in um in within a framework in which a loving god exists 
but but the world we live in is not just described by the bible it's also entered by the god of the bible yeah. and that means that he willingly is subjected to the pain and suffering that the people he loves are subjected to hmm. so in jesus we don't just encounter a loving god who empathizes with us from a distance but a loving god who actually suffers with us and ultimately redemptively for us so a suffering world is kind of diagnosed and described there's a framework in which we can make sense of our experiences of rage and of pain and of the preciousness of life the suffering world is then entered into and there's this presence of God with us in suffering because Jesus has been through it all mm. for us that means that as he offers us his presence today we can actually trust that and experience his love but then the Bible also speaks of a future hope and we lean into a future hope that one day there will be no more pain. Our tears will be wiped from our eyes so we can live as people of hope. Not that I live in a bubble. I'm never going to get cancer. I'm never going to die because I'm a Christian. Nothing mm. bad's going to happen to me. No, living as people of hope that that one day in eternity God has set all things right so there's a past there's a presence of God in our suffering and there's a future hope I think that's totally unique mm. you don't see that in any other worldview and it's really powerful and talking about the suffering that we see in Jesus life obviously the the ultimate kind of suffering from that perspective that he had to endure it for our salvation, for humanity at large, it's clear that suffering obviously serves some kind of purpose then in God's picture of the world. Suffering has a place and a purpose. In our own lives, when we bring it down into our human experience, what do you think the role of suffering is? Whether it is that sort of day-to-day -day stuff or the, the perhaps lower end of the spectrum, if you look at it like that, of job losses or simple things like that right through to, as you mentioned, friends that we lose, those instances of rape or abuse of any kind of description, what do you think the role of suffering is in the human life? I think that there's a very powerful connection between suffering and love within the Christian worldview. Suffering um, is a is a, an outworking and a, and a consequence of love. You know, we, we feel pain because of love whether it's the loss of a, a person and the realization that that is more than the loss of the atoms of their body just no longer living it's so much deeper than that because we loved them or whether it's the loss of a job the loss of of a, a sort of experience that we've enjoyed and then the questions that that brings up as to whether we are genuinely loved and what I think um the role of suffering in the Christian life can be is to actually deepen our experience of what it means to be loved and to love, which is, you know, the definition, one of the definitional statements of the Bible is that, is that God is loved. It, so it causes us to question that. And therefore, if we do walk through it and process it with God and with his presence to experience that love in a deeper and more profound way, I, I would always want to be careful um, about sort of presenting suffering as a sort of self-improvement tool. Mm. I think the Bible does speak about a deep work of God in the life of a believer that happens as we suffer and that, that it, there's a sort of Christological element to that because Jesus has suffered and redemption happens um, through God's love through God's suffering there's an ident a deep identification with Christ but it's not a kind of mechanistic um sort of sadistic process mm, because it can be and really so unhealthy I think we have to be careful about that it's also a really hard thing for people who have been through something truly tragic and truly traumatic to think that there was any kind of reason behind it or that there can be good that comes from it. So from your own perspective personally, how do you find mm. hope and how do you recover yeah. from those times where yeah. your own suffering, your own trials have actually been just horrendous? Well, I think step number one is not to minimise. And the desire of the church often or faith communities often is to say, it's all for it's all for good, you know, to jump there too quickly. And um, one of the things I try and do in the book is to break suffering down from a sort of blob of 
there's this idea of suffering into there's grief when someone you love dies. Um, there's the suffering of chronic illness. There's the reality of the suffering of mental illness, whether that's um, trauma related or suicidal thoughts or self-harm. There's suffering that comes through violence that is perpetrated. There's suffering through natural disasters. And actually to, to, to breathe in the seriousness of that and to say that in the Bible, that is what happens. You have a whole book of the Bible in Lamentations devoted to the devastation caused by war. You have a book of the Bible dev uh, devoted to processing an experience of slavery and moving out of slavery. You have um, the suffering of women fully explored and empathised with in the Bible. So um, I think to not qu too quickly move to, you know, this sort of mechanistic, oh, it's all fine, mm. without actually walking through the anger, walking through um, the devastation, the devastation of loss and realising that God doesn't ask us to jump to it's all fine and there's the redemptive purpose to it too, mm. too quickly because because the Bible actually journeys through um, suffering in this really, really profound way. And there's people listening to us right now who are probably th in a position of heartache, perhaps there'd be people of all sorts of different walks of life. What would you yeah. say to that person who right now is really in the midst of some serious suffering, perhaps even in their own individual life, or they're just looking at the world and are totally overwhelmed by what's going on? What would you say to them to help them process that experience? Um, well, I'd want to say to them that how you feel about what you're going through matters because you matter. You matter very, very deeply to the God who made this world and who loves you and has given you the capacity to love. And your processing of your experience of suffering um, doesn't need to be minimised. It, 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 it certainly shouldn't be, you know, beaten up with the stick of have more faith and just get over it. But actually, um, there is a God who, who loves you and, and who fully has entered into our human experience of suffering and who wants to be with you in that in a meaningful way. And to walk through, you know, the worst aspects of that, not just a sort of sanitised religious version of it. So I would encourage you to reach out to him, to call out to him. And if you feel I don't even have the words to do that, he has actually given us words to do that in the Psalms. He's given mm. us words to do that in the prophets in the Old Testament. So it may be that you feel so angry and bereft and spent that you can't even pray. And that is okay too. God has 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 even made a space for us when we're when we're in that place. So um my yeah my encouragement to you would be perhaps to open open a Bible and read through some psalms and um, and begin to cry out to God in the language of others if, if you don't even have words yourself. Mm. And even knowing, I guess, that in sitting there, maybe not saying anything, God's still there. He's still he's yeah. still actually yeah. with us. I think yeah. that's a really, it's a yeah. really cool picture and it's such timely advice that you bring. And the words that you've brought forward in the book, the advice that you give, the stories that you tell, I think they really do have a great uh, opportunity to change the discussions that the church has about suffering and that each of us personally have about suffering. How would you hope that it impacts our perspective on suffering going forward? I hope that um, the book helps um, people who don't believe in God process their suffering and realise that the Christian faith is not just true evidentially but it is also deeply true experientially and in terms of um, describing and um, being active in the real world that we all experience including in this area of suffering. I hope that the book um, helps Christians who are struggling with this process um, the genuine intellectual dilemma, how could it be that this world is what exists and that there is the loving God that we're told exists? And I hope that um, ultimately it, it 
enables people to to deeply process what they've been through not a sanitized version of what they've been through Mm. a true version of what they've been through within the context of of a loving God and to encounter God therefore in a deeper and more meaningful way. Dr. Amy, thank you so much for chatting with us about it and for putting your words to paper in such a beautiful way. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for giving me the opportunity.